Artist to Art. I'm Aaron Jack over at Aaron Jack Line Art, and we're going to have Zach Lieberman today. So welcome today to another amazing live. Zach is amazing. So here we go. We're going to go live. Zach, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Here we go. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Good. How about you? I'm good. Nice. Where? So, where are you first? I'm, I'm in Brooklyn. Nice. Yeah. Cool. How about How about yourself? Uh, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, nice. Yeah. So not too far away. We've got the same <laughs> uh, time zone going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so how's uh, how's everything going for you? I mean, with in this strange, strange, <laughs> uncertain time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this week is crazy. Uh, I, mm, yeah, I mean, it's been uh, a totally um, roller coaster, just a really strange year. This week, in particular, just like waiting, 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 you know, to see the results of the election and, uh, and, and just really, um, yeah, on edge, all the time on edge. Um, but yeah, I, uh, one thing that's been really nice is, um, is just not traveling and being home and with the family we're just we go out on the weekend and we go hiking every weekend and just i feel like i'm doing a lot of things that i wouldn't normally do um and and that way i'm i'm very thankful for this moment but i i'm a teacher i love being in the classroom with students and i miss it and you know i can't wait to can't wait for this to be over that's there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, there's sorry, I don't there. have a good. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really hard question. How is 2020? Right. <laughs> I mean, how do you interpret it poetically? Because you you kind mm -hmm. of seem to have these side these two different aspects, like really hardcore going on with poetry and coding. Like, how do you interpret this time poetically, and you know, with your work? I mean, I, I always try to with the work that I do. So I post a lot of animation and really try to focus on, you know, how can you create emotion through motion, right? Where, through, through movement, how can you, you know, make a feeling and, you know, give, create a mood for people. And a lot of times those things that I make, they're very personal. They're like diary entries. So in a way I'm trying to express, you know, I feel really anxious or I feel really compressed or I feel really exuberant. Um, and, you know, I was thinking a lot about this because when Trump was elected, I, I felt like we were living in a cartoon universe. And when I go back to those sketches from, you know, 2016, they are like, I was taking, um, cartoons and I was breaking them up and taking Charlie Brown and flipping it upside down and extruding, you know, just taking the language of cartoons. Cause that's what the moment felt like. Or, um, after, Trump was inaugurated and we were protesting. My wife and I were protesting like every weekend. It felt like we were, um, you know, I don't know, at the, um, at JFK, we were at the Women's March, you know, we were out on the street and I just felt this like, I'm with other people pushing. So I wanna show that with my work, even if it's not explicit, just like give that feeling of what it feels like to be pushing. So I, I think as an artist, you try to find those those gestures or those small things and figure out how can you bring them to the things that you're making. Wow, that's awesome. So how is it in this moment? Because this is a very particular time in history that we're having this discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so much. Yeah. So much on the precipice, I'd say, of like what could be or what is. And uh, how do you, in I mean, your interpretations are, are so, uh, you can evoke so much. So mm -hmm. how, how do you, how do you wrestle with that? And how, and how will that maybe enter into your work or not? I mean, it's also, I think of art as also an escape too, you know, that you don't, you don't need to address everything head on, but you could try to try to just show how you're feeling or what this moment, feel, you know, this is a really complex moment. And, and it's very hard to unpack, you know, and I think we're going to need, we're going to need poetry, we're going to need artists, we're going to need songwriters, you know, to, you know, um, we're going to need movie scripts, we're going to need lots of art that help will help us understand because we're going through a collective, you know, re a real collective trauma together, you know, 
th- thousands of people dying, you know, being having lockdown, having people losing their jobs, you know, other people, ha- you know, having to work in really unsafe conditions. It's a really like a dramatic moment. And I think, I don't know about my own personal role, but I just think there's a lot of space for the arts to tell stories and to express and to unpack like the complexities of life. And this is a really complex moment. That's for sure. So what would your maybe dream of that be? Like if you had a dream of what that looked like, you know, whether it's like how microscopic or macroscopic you wanted that to be, but what would that that be within like the arts, like a larger, um, like any sort of larger vision than just yourself? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I have a very clear dream. I just always wish that people have like, that more people have their voices, you know, more more voices are elevated and there's, there's more space for um, people to create and more tools and platforms and institutions. And so I always, you know, I don't know if I have a specific dream, but I always think the world is really hungry for new tools, for new platforms. And, and you know, that's, I don't know if that's like a dream necessarily, but just to say that there's space for that. There should be space for that. That's so beautiful. And you, you have your own like school going on, right? With this, yeah. with a poetry yeah. coding? Like, yeah. Yeah, I helped start a school called the School for Poetic Computation. We're an experimental school based in New York. For many years, I was a professor. So I taught at Parsons, which is a design school in New York. Um, and I, uh, for, I don't know, a decade, I was a professor and uh, I was an adjunct. I was really happy. And then at some point, I got really tired of university life. And some friends and I decided to start our own school. And we started the School for Poetic Computation seven years ago and we've been doing these 10 week programs we have shorter programs um and and it's a kind of experimental school like a homemade school um and and i love it it's really fun it's it's challenging it's really really demanding and challenging but also just such a beautiful experience and then uh, about two years ago i started um i became a professor at mit in the media lab so i went back to university world so i sort of left university world um went into kind of like, what would it feel like to start our own school? And then I'm back in university world, but I sort of have my feet in both um, camps in a way. Wow. So what's, what, um, what drives you in both of those worlds? Like, what's the, what's like something at the heart? What are some aspects at the heart of that matter? That you're I mean, I, I love being around students. I love it. I love the, um, I always feel like students are just on the edge of something, you know, that there are, and, and it's this, you get to witness people giving a gift to themselves. Like if you go study, if you say like, I'm gonna do a, a degree, I'm gonna study this thing, or I'm gonna go to this 10 week program, or I'm gonna do a residency, or whatever it is, that's a gift. You're giving yourself time. And I'm just so like fascinated with how people use that gift and don't use that gift and what can I do to help and, and, and just to see people like, it's not always like large breakthroughs, but really small discoveries, those things like, that, for me, that's really fascinating. And in a lot of ways, I think of myself more like a vampire also, which is I really get a lot of energy from my students because for them, it's new. For me, it's old, right? To do this stuff, coding, making art with code, I've done it for a long time. But when I see students, they have, they're, they're writing their first line of code for the you know, first time or they're seeing, they're making something work. And for me, that's so amazing. And I try to just capture that energy. And like a vampire, I feel like I kind of like, I want to get that energy then bring it to my own practice. Wow, so that's, that's an intense like exchange of energy there between the teacher and the student, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's also, it's like a, you, you want to create these spaces for, um, for collaboration as well. And like, they have a lot to, you know, I, I always feel like you don't want the classroom to be like, just this one way, like, I'm going to come in and lecture and like, I'm going to tell you what the truth is, but more like, we all have a bunch of questions, right? And, and the key, uh, like, the best thing is conversation, right? The best thing for a classroom is just to get people talking. So sometimes it's the teacher, your job as a teacher to like, set to ask those questions, but oftentimes it's just getting people to talk to each other and creating situations where you get, you know, how do you create 
bandwidth for dialogue. What do you see? What are some ways that you created bandwidth for dialogue that have that bridge those gaps between this computational science and the art world? Because those are those are sometimes two very different things. But how do you get them to translate to each other, and then the students to also have that converse those conversations? Yeah, and that's an interesting question. And one thing that I really like um, is the exercise we do on the first day of class at the SFPC is we have this blank piece of paper and we ask people to write down, everybody's calm, they introduce themselves, and then we ask them to take a blank piece of paper and write down every question that they have that brought them into the room. And then they meet in groups and they take all these questions, about 20, 30 minutes of just silent writing questions. And then they come back together 20, 30, you know, after 20, 30 minutes, they come back together in groups and they catalog the questions. They say, these are technical questions. These are aesthetic questions. Some of these questions have no answer. Some of these questions are about life. Some of these questions are technical, like how do you do, how do you connect X to Y or Y to Z or something like that. But the questions lead to conversation. So I always feel it's, you know, it's, it's creating that, that sort of context where students and just everybody can feel like they can ask questions and then start those conversations. In terms of the kind of art and... Um, we lost signal here for a second, it seems like. Is that happening to anybody else? Uh, just give me some comments down there, uh, in, down below. Uh, what happened in the stream because it seems like uh, Zach's okay Zach's paused for a second but hopefully he'll be back in a moment uh, I know that we have oh Zach left so Zach's back we're gonna get Zach right back on and that's the beauty of the world so hang in there invite your friends that's the way it works Zach's wow back. that was that there was that was really trippy. So I, for some reason, well, I'm outside and my, I think my phone got hot or something. I, I couldn't see you anymore. So I touched it. I like maybe cl close Instagram. I don't know what happened, but then I logged back in and then I saw myself talking to you. It was like, it was so, so trippy. It was really trippy. It was like I went back in time or something. It's like, it's like, no, I'm here. But then this other version of me is answering a question. I don't understand. Maybe there's like a time delay if you're a viewer. I don't understand. But yeah. anyway. There, yeah. There's a time delay if you're a viewer. So that way, okay. if, I think it happens if either of us have like a phone call or something. It's like a very slight delay that the audience is just ever so slightly behind us. Oh, that's so strange. That's really, really strange. <laughs> that was so bizarre. Anyway, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. like I, I'm <laughs> curious how that would like look in your artwork like what's that you know because you, you have such a in so much of your work you have this like <laughs> such interesting interaction between the uh the uh, the audience and then the person interacting with the thing and yeah how, how do you understand that like delay or not delay i mean i don't know there's really interesting projects that use time in one way or another so um there's a project which i really love called um uh, Chrome, mm. it'll come to me. It's um, Kronos projector, and it's basically this projection. And the surface, when you touch it, you can change. So imagine if you have a video like a time lapse, and you take all of those frames and you stack them. So a given pixel, you could like, if you go, if you jump to another frame, that pixel is like jumping back in time. So it allows you to push like on an image you can push and make those pixels go forward or backwards in time and it's like that's that sort of thing's a trip like i really love the kind of this with media art you can manipulate time and you can play with time and that that's one of my favorite projects in that kind of space i love that's, it yeah i i love how i love that like how do you how do you push and pull time and and we did it live here. <laughs> yeah, that was that was strange. That was like, I, I have this problem. So I teach with, with Zoom. And I have this problem where sometimes I do a lot of breakout rooms because I love the students to talk to each other. And I'll observe and I'll jump from one. Uh, oh, it's called Kronos Projector. I think Kate like this Kronos Projector. It's by uh, an artist named um, Alvaro, um, Alvaro Casanelli. Um, 
it's a really, really nice artist. And um, so, uh, so I do the Zoom, I have Zoom calls, you know, with students and I breakout rooms and I'll switch from one breakout room to another. And then sometimes I like can't enter the breakout rooms anymore and I have to leave the Zoom call, but I'm the teacher. And then I log back in and then it's, you get this message that's like, you know, there's breakout rooms and wait to be assigned, but I'm the person who runs the call. So then I get nervous that my students will be like stuck in a breakout room forever. And I'm like, in, not in the room. It's very strange. So there's a lot of like, I don't know, I feel like we're all learning with these systems, new ways of communicating. Wow, that it sounds like pretty meta. Like if you're just like stuck in a Zoom room forever, it just <laughs> like a Zoom a Zoom purgatory where it's like <laughs> like they will assign you to a breakout room, but like I'm the person that assigned people to breakout rooms. So yeah, it's really, very strange. It, it's yeah. it's interesting, like that idea of like what that surprise is. Like you you were talking about like what it is for someone to like write their first line of code. Like yeah. And, and then like all of a sudden that like surprise when something like works or doesn't work, like how do you grapple with that yourself? Like as you know, when you're I mean, it's like magic, right? You're making something and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then you change something and then it's like, oh, okay, bang, you know, then you're, you know, and it, it it's like, I think when you're doing anything, it's like incremental progress, incremental progress, incremental, incremental progress, and then breakthrough. And then something happens where you're like, okay, what if I connect this to this? And I think all creativity is combinatorial thinking that you're not, you're not making new things. You're just fitting things together in different ways and saying, okay, how do I, I have this thing, I have this thing. How do I like stick them together? Um, and when you have a breakthrough, it's like, you can make a lot of progress, you know, then, then it's exciting. And so sometimes I will, you know, when I'm sketching, I will make one thing and it's very slow, very slow process. And then I'll get really excited. I'll make three things at once. Cause it's, you know, and then I'm like, Oh, what if I tried this? What if I tried this? What if I tried this? And it's, those moments are really fascinating. Wow. So how do you do anything that's like particular to set those moments up for your students or have you found anything that's particular? I mean, I always think with students, the best thing you can do is give them, um, give them kind of constrained assignments. So not open-ended, but you give constraints and that the creativity comes with dealing with those constraints. So like the worst assignment is very open-ended and the best assignment is something where it feels like, a chore, but is like a joy, you know, where you are, you, you have a very clear um, instruction of what to do and a very clear scope, but actually the creativity is in, in working with that in that scope. Um, I, I don't know, I, in general, I feel like with students, the best thing you can do is, you know, model curiosity, you can show students that it's okay to be curious, you can um, create uh, like you, you model the values that you that you care about. So for me, it's curiosity and openness, right? Are you are you curious? What are you obsessed with? And you don't have to be obsessed with what I'm obsessed with. But I want you to be, you know, like, for me, it's whatever graphic design, you know, I don't know, Japanese design posters from the 80s or some visual language where I feel like that language really speaks to me. And so I will learn as much as I can and I'll collect and I, you know, and I, I want, I want the students to be obsessed in some other way. And I think you can model that you can model that curiosity and you can model um, openness in terms of those breakthroughs. I think that just happens from doing the work, you know, that you just do the work. And if you show up and do the work, then, you know, you will, those moments of breakthroughs will come. Wow. So, so you mentioned the Japanese posters from the 80s being so yeah. influential. Could you tell me yeah. a little bit about like, what's the, or is that like the thing that's going <laughs> right now? Or is that like a... I mean, it's one, it's one thing. I mean, that's just the sort of thing. I think like a lot of design language in particular, I'm really fascinated with like certain genres or moments. And then I also post things like poster design where you have to put a lot of thought into an image, right? I always think about an image. If you look at an image, consider how much thought was put into it. It could be a photograph that you took on a whim. It could be a professional photographer who like sweated all the details and thought a lot about it. Something that I find so beautiful about posters is that they are images that require a lot of thoughts. 
right? You you really sweat it if you're going to put and posters are designed for outdoor communication. Like that's what a poster is. It's designed to be on the streets to tell somebody like, hey, there's a show, there's a thing, there's this. There's an ad I'm advertising a product. It's it's like designed to capture your eye and communicate information. And for me, that is when I look at a at posters that are really well done, you can tell there's a lot of thought that went into it. And I, that for me, that really resonates the kind of the images that have a lot of thought behind them. And then the eighties, I don't know, but there's, there's a kind of like a very cheer, cheerfulness and a playfulness with geometry that I really love. Um, that I think, it, you know, I wanted to bring that to my own work. That's beautiful. So what are the thoughts that are like running through your head right now that you know you talk about this thoughtfulness um that's behind it like what's do does that like internally go through you or how do you process these like thoughts that go into your own work i mean i, I don't know you mean in terms of like what i'm making when i'm making it or either and both really yeah. like when, when you're making it but also just like as you're processing through ideas like as you're kind of like seeing art you know, is it like observation of the outside world or observation of these posters or what? I mean, it's a bit of, it's a bit of everything, right? So sometimes it's outside world when I'm feeling more like diary entry, sometimes it's like an inspiration. Like you find a, like an artist that you really love and you try to figure out what is the essence or some idea from this artist that you can take with you. Like um, I went to the museum and I saw this sculpture from Ruth Asawa. It's a really beautiful wire sculpture. And you see these hanging forms where it's just circles getting like larger and smaller coming from the ceiling. And I love this idea of just a very simple like geometry expanding and contracting and drawing a path. You know, and, it, and it's, it's a, t a tiny thing, a tiny feeling, but you can say, okay, there's something from this work that I want to carry forward and that I want to explore. Um, and then oftentimes it's inspired by an algorithm where I, I'll get excited about like, oh, you can do like, for example, curves. Like I love curve algorithms around curves and we have these, you know, Bezier curves and Catmull Rom curves, but there's all these other ones that are more esoteric that are like, you know, there's a sort of mainstream curve and then there's the like underground curve and there's the, you know, and you start researching and like, oh, wow, like the curves that they use to design highways because you can't, you can't, like when you're driving that fast, you can't curve that quickly. So there's, there's a curve called the clothide curve, which is the curve that you use to design highways or train tracks. And like, that's really beautiful or um, curves like you when you're flying an airplane, like you can't make a right turn, right? You can only go forward and turn a little bit. And so those curves lead to a certain kind of geometry that's different than Catmoram or Bezier. And it's like learning a new language where you feel like you can, ex you can just express a different thought. You can, if you, if you pick up something like that, then in that, that allows you to express something completely different. So for me, sometimes it'll just be a, a geometric algorithm or, yeah, uh, kind of a breakthrough on getting something to work or compile that, I, that I'll get excited about. Wow. What's like the newest curve that you're excited about? Mm. One thing that I've been really excited about is um, this thing called Poseidon. Um, how do I? Uh, it's like Poseidon filling algorithm. Um, and it is, uh, it's like a way of taking geometry and blurring it. So for example, if you take like a, sh um, I don't know how to, the best way to describe it. If you have like a, a blank canvas and you put like a white line and a red line, it will interpolate between them. So it'll take all the blank pixels and it'll just, it's, it's based on heat dissipation. If you have like something which is really hot, how would that energy dissipate, you know? And, but you can do it with colors. So you can say, I have like this color over here, this color over here, this color over here. And the algorithm will figure out the mixture. And I've been doing this in a very um, complicated way. I've been doing it in shaders and I've been like per, at a per pixel level saying, how close am I to this color? How close am I to this color? Let me do the, the mixture. But this is an algorithm that does it extremely fast where you just draw it and then it kind of like makes it smaller, makes it smaller, makes it smaller. And then it makes it larger, larger, larger. And then like, it's almost like magic. Um, so that is, it's a way of doing something that I have been doing before, but like, you know, a hundred times faster or something like that. So then I can, I can try things that I couldn't try before. So when I was doing it in shaders, I could only have like 20 color points. 
now I could have an, an infinite number of color points, you know, and that for me, that is like, a, it opens up different possibilities. Wow. So what's on the precipice of like, what's possible right now? If you could say like, what's the next thing that you're just like, going to play around with? What's that? What's that thing? Um, or those I mean, one thing that I've been experimenting with this last week is um, LiDAR. So you, the new phones and like the uh, iPad Pro, they have like a very fancy camera. And I always think that the interesting things about these cameras are they allow you to sense the world in new ways. And we're in a little bit of an arms race between like Google and Apple and Facebook and Snap and you know, these kind of large companies, they are developing AR platforms for augmented reality. Um, but they offer a lot of potential for creative exploration. So if you can understand, like, where is my camera in space? Or what is the geometry around me look like? You can tell stories in different ways. So um, you there? Yeah, give me an example here, because I think, I think yeah. the audience might need, like, an example or two here. Yeah, I mean, AR, so AR... Um, so for example, I have an app called weird type where you can write typography and you can draw in the air. Well, that's, that comes because the, there's markerless tracking on your phone. Now your phone can figure out, you know, where it is in 3d space, which means you can write a word and have that word stay there. Um, you know, so for me, that kind of thing's exciting. Like the, you like your vote thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Somebody did that. So they, made a bunch of like letters that spelled out a word and then put it in there. So that is, that is based on some software and some hardware things that are happening on the device. Um, so, so it's kind of like the advancement of technology allows you to explore new realms. Yeah, exactly. And so for me, the LiDAR stuff is really interesting because it's a structured light on your device. So it's building a 3D model. As you wave your phone around, it's building almost like a, a mesh, a 3D mesh of your world. Um, and that allows you to do interesting things. Uh, Pamela asks, uh, what's, what's the app called? So there's two apps. One is called Weird Type, and the other one is called Weird Cuts. And Weird Type is an iOS app, and Weird Cuts is iOS and Android. Um, and they're both AR applications. I'm going to write that one down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so weird, weird type, weird cuts. That's yeah. uh, that's cool for everybody else out there. Go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's check out some of your uh, some of your work. I've got. I should be able to get some of it on here. Uh, let's see what we've got here. I have images. I have videos. Let's see what what's what. Uh, cool. Let me start yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's happening? Uh, I think I was playing. I don't remember. A lot of stuff I've been sketching for years. I think I was experimenting with um, some 3D forms. Uh, and I had. I don't know what's happening in this one. That's it's cool. like a, It's like a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't. How about this? How do you feel about it now, looking back? Oh, I love it. I mean, it feels like I love stuff which is sketchy. Like, I really love... Um, like sketchy lines. I always want to try to make computer graphics that don't feel like computer graphics. So something like this, it feels like you could easily just make this with a pen, right? This could be the sort of thing where you could, you know, if you looked at it, you could imagine somebody with a piece of paper drawing. And, uh, and for me, that's the sort of thing I love. If, you, if it doesn't feel like computer graphics. Interesting. All right. This is a, this is a, I sent you a lot of old images. So I think what is happening is I had a cube and I was rotating it in 3D and then exploding the pieces out in, in some way, the geometry from the cube and then rounding them. So a lot of times I'll take shapes and I'll blur, like I'm really into um, taking polygons and blurring them to make them rounder. So I think the, the, the actual geometry is coming from a cube, from a spinning cube. But then there are a bunch of like facets that I've um, like blurred in some way. And I like to do a lot of blurring and drawing gradients. So it looks like that's what's happening here. Um, this is, I do a lot of experiments with pendulums. I really like, if you think about your arm, your arm is like a pendulum, right? You have 
you there's a kinetic like drawing is a kinetic act right it's a it's it's about kin kinematics so i do these things where, where i build these kind of pendulums that move randomly and they draw a curve they draw a surface and then i here i'm taking a texture of ink and mapping it onto that curve so that curve is created from this digital motion but i always like if i have some analog texture then seeing what this sort of digital thing with this analog thing feels like that's uh, that's beautiful. <laughs> uh, so, what are what are the curves that are going on here? Because you mentioned like the different types of curves, and I mean these are curves that come from um, pendulums. So, if you there's two there's two arms, and one of them I'm just giving a random impulse to move to rotate in some direction, and the other one I'm giving a random impulse, and then once they slow down, I give them another movement. So, if you watch them, it's very hard to see in this video, but occasionally you'll see these black lines. There'll be like these little thin black lines and like black circles. And those are the, those are the pendulums. Those are the arms that are doing the drawing. Very cool. Um, this is what I was talking about with LIDAR. So this is taking um, the, the, the footage, like as you move through the space, um, and turning it into a 3D model, but then manipulating the color on that 3D model. So it's using the data from your camera and the 3D geometry that the LiDAR gives you, and it creates this kind of chromey, like, weird texture. Wow. Wow. So, so it's creating a 3D model of the full space and yeah. then manipulating that. And model. manipulating the texture on that model. So if you were to look at the model, it's very low resolution. It, even in this video, you can probably see like triangles. It's not a very high resolution model. But then the color of that model comes from the camera. But there's a little bit of like manipulation that gives it the waviness. And that's where, where it starts to feel like mylar or some sort of surface. Oh. I really like this one. Yeah. So this is an animation that I made for... Um, a series, this I guess, a series of animations that I made for Ella Manes, who's a Colombian musician, um, and her album just came out. And her, um, she commissioned me to make short animations based on language. So each of the songs, taking a phrase from the song and animating it, and then also taking um, her uh, her hand movements and and visualizing it. So she filmed her hands, and then I wrote software to analyze her movements. Um, awesome. So somebody asked what hardware are you using for the Chrome app? So that I'm using an iPad Pro. So the latest iPad Pro have LiDAR and then I guess the new iPhone, some of the new iPhones have LiDAR. Um, and then I've been using um, that I did in, in Lens Studio, but you could do it in Open Frameworks or some other tool. Yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. Oh, I love this project. So this is a project that I made in uh, London. This was for the London Literature Festival. This is at the South Bank Center. Um, and this was for Margaret Atwood. We took the text from her novel. Um, I froze for a sec. Are you, yeah, I, I see you. Yeah, OK. Um, we took the text from her novel, and we mapped it on on people's body. So um, there are these moments in the novel uh, that we took like the actual language, the actual text from the novel, and then you can perform it with your body. Wow. How did she feel about it? Like how did, how was oh, that she, she really loved it. When I worked with her, it was like working with Beyonce. So I like you, you know, she's really like, it's Margaret Atwood. So I would write an email and then it would go to her publisher, her publisher send it to her agent, her agent send it to her assistant, assistant send it to her second assistant. Um, and she'd be like, thumbs up or whatever. Uh, and then she, <laughs> she, she got there and she loved it. She was really, she, she was so good at using it. Um, and she told me that if Shakespeare was alive, that he would be using a connect. She was really like, yeah, she, she was very excited about the connect and I was showing her how it worked and all the technology and yeah, she was fascinated. Wow. Do you have anything that you would like to like move this aspect forward with like the literature? I, I mean, cause I see you're using some of it, but like this, you're particularly using it. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot to explore with typography and language and animation. A good, a good question is, how did the text themes from the novel inform the aesthetic? Um, so the novel is called Hagseed, and it's a kind of modern-day um, interpretation of The Tempest. 
And there were these moments, there were kind of key moments in the book um, that we focused on that were specifically around um, feeling alone, feeling solitude, feeling chaos and, um, and feeling like almost sort of sinister. And we took those moments and we focused on them. So we took passages from those moments and the kind of visual language from those moments. So when you approach the, the installation, you see a quote and then you can start to perform with your body. And then the, the, the text that you see on your body comes from that page in the book. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Kevin Deland just wrote it. So thank you, Kevin. Oh, cool. Just wanted to, he, he does really cool work with like mathematics and like learning stuff. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So what's going on here? <laughs> All right. So that, this is just noise. This is a little bit like your, your temporal distortion. So um, I think this is recording, you know, um, layers. So recording video, if you think about a video, not like almost as a 3D form, like a cube where you have time and you have a new frame of video and you have all the older frames behind it, then you can choose where you pick the pixels from. So a lot like the Kronos projector that I talked about, and this is just using noise, which is a kind of a mathematical function um, to say where in time are we going to go forward or backwards. And if I stand still, you'll see the same thing. But as I start to move my head, you get, it gets more distorted because there's more, as you, you can see, like I'm moving a bit and you can see those pixels changing slowly. So you're, so, so the more you move, then the more that it impacts time. Or... Yeah, the more distorted it is. So you, if you think about it, every pixel in this image is based on, I don't know, maybe 10, five seconds of video. So five seconds times 30 frames this is about 150 frames. So if I'm standing still, then those 150 frames will be the same. But if I'm moving, then those 150 frames are very different. And so what you're seeing here is a very kind of like slow way to understand time that you can kind of like take video and then say, okay, I want this pixel to be forward in time or backwards in time. Wow. So what, um, what was going on? What, what were you discovering through this process? I mean, I was, um, I think in that time I was probably thinking a bit about that Kronos projector and just saying, okay, could I take that, I, the, that energy and apply it to a webcam? Um, I, you know what happened with this is I was making an example for my students. Uh, oftentimes it happens that I'll make an example, like I wanna talk about, because um, in media art, there's a common um, form which is called the slit scan, where you either take like a line of pixels and you paint it across. So you wind up creating like a displacement of time that way. Like if, you're, if you've ever had the experience of like Xeroxing and you move your fingers with the head of the Xerox, you can make like long fingers. So there's a technique called slit scan. And I think I was showing my students slit scan, but an alternative approach where you store a bunch of frames and you can draw them in a different way. And I, this came out of like some, some example for my students probably. That's cool. Uh, this is some, so I do a lot of shader programming and shader programming is a different, it's a, it's a form of programming. It's a little hard to explain, but basically to say, rather than drawing geometry, you're writing code at the pixel level. So you're saying like, you're not drawing a shape or drawing a curve or thinking about like this sort of form, but you're saying at the pixel level, let me write some small code where you can say what color this pixel should be based on all kinds of information. This pixel should be orange or should be yellow or should be green. And this form of programming is really fun because you, those, that small code, you can keep um, reloading it. So you can basically type code and then see it and type code and see it and type code and see it. And it's a very different, when I'm coding normally, I like think a lot and then I press play and it compiles and takes time. And when I do shader programming, it's very like, it feels like jazz. Like you're really just like, oh, what if I did this? What if I did this? And it's just so fun to see like auto code reloading and, and seeing your changes immediately from language to visual. Wow, that's so cool. Um, so this is experiments with typography. Um, and in particular, I do a lot of experiments where I, I'm interested in where is type legible, right? So there's these moments where Obviously it settles and you can read it, one, two, three, four, five. But there's these moments where it's like kind of illegible. And that boundary for me is really interesting. Like where is this 
where do you find it like break, right? Where does it break um, for your brain, for your eye, for whatever. And so what I'm doing here is I have type, I'm probably rotating it in 3D and then I'm projecting it back into 2D and I'm looking at the intersections. So if you think about it, like you have, it's a 3D form, 3D lines, but then I, I make it 2D again and I look at like, where are the, what are the interior shapes, right? Where these things overlap and let me fill them in with color. So it's a kind of experimentation of 3D going from 2D to 3D to 2D with typography. Wow. What, um, what made you really want to look at like where those aspects break up? Like, I mean, I, that's a common thing is to think, I, I think of exploring like, you know, where, where do we recognize things? Where do we recognize a face? Where do we recognize human movement? That's sort of threshold of perception. I find that very beautiful. Like those, those boundaries. And for me with typography, that boundary of legibility is, I, I think is really fascinating. Hmm. So these are experiments that I'm doing together with my partner, Momo Kuo, um, and she's been dancing. She was taking these, um, she's been taking these workshop, these classes um, from an Israeli choreographer um, in the morning. And then she's been um, uh, in the studio, in our studio, she films herself. And then I run the footage through um, a program that finds the contour so it's finding the outline of her body and then adding graphics on top. And we can do this sort of thing we can do in real time, but we're doing offline. So she's filming herself and then we'll hang out in front of the laptop and experiment and try to find kind of visual looks that express what we want to express. Interesting. How, how does that uh, collaboration work for you that like to like really find those uh, what you're looking for? I mean, it's great. It's really like we push each other and, um, and she's a very tough, she's really tough critic for me. So if she likes it, then it, it must be good. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, oh, is this the vote thing? Yeah. I can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is like, so there's this um, photographer, Bryce Willem, um, and he has, he's really, like perfected this technique with weird type. So weird type has this mode where it's called explode. And you basically can write a message and the, the letters stay in the air. And when you walk towards them, they move. <clears throat> and what he found is that if you type a lot of letters, they're very small. So he, he used the maximum number of letters to make a line. And then he starts drawing in 3D. It's basically like making a line drawing tool out of this typography tool but each of those points are letters so it's it's really like not what i expected the app he's using it in a completely unexpected way so for me it's really exciting wow do you enjoy doing those apps and finding the like and then you find the unexpected within that um yeah I, I love making apps i love the creativity that people bring to them it's always a challenge like whenever you make things like that it's always there's always technical challenges and you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's so beautiful to see the creativity that people bring to it. So if I had, um, if I could, I would love to make more apps. You know, if I had the time or the bandwidth, like I would love to. But I love, Weird Type has been so beautiful to see what people do. Cool. What's going on? Oh, cool. Um, so this is, it looks like a still frame from... I, a lot of the earliest, earliest sketches. So you have to scroll like all the way to the bottom of my Instagram, which is really a pain because I've been sketching for, um, I guess, yeah, four or five years now. Um, the earliest sketches were around light and reflection. So very, very simple algorithm, which is like if you have a line, you could calculate how the line bounces off another line which means you could say like, I want there to be walls here and I want there to be light, you know, the light is gonna bounce off those walls. So I think what's happening here is our experiments with reflection and refraction, where I have a bunch of walls that are circles and I have light that's moving around through the circles. Wow. I think these are more light simulation, like just experimenting with, um, with rays of light. 
Oh, so this is a, it's zoomed in a lot, but this is like my, um, my avatar. So I, a lot of the work that I do involves blobs. I love blob shapes. I think like blob is a kind of key of life. Like, um, you know, cells are blobs. And I just think the blob is a kind of iconic, I don't know, I feel like it's a fundamental form, like a building block, a graphical form. Um, and so I, here I was experimenting with blob shapes that have textures mapped onto them. So taking image from a webcam, like my eye, and mapping it onto a blob shape that's moving. And my um, oh. st my my uh, stepdaughter hated this. She was, <laughs> she, she, hated, she was like, this is so gross. So, <laughs> um, this is a set of circles, or probably blob shapes. I don't know how I made it, um, with a lot of noise. So they feel more organic. So again, I like this kind of thing that feels like a hand-drawn, you know, it's computational, it's generative, but feels like it could come from the hand. This is blob, blob connected to blob through curves. This is taking my hand and then extruding it. So taking the outline of my hand and then extruding it and coloring the, um, coloring the, the lines in some way. Um, you love blobs. Soda. I love blobs. <laughs> I would say I could do if I could do blobs only. I would do blobs only. Oh, this is amazing. This image is really incredible. So this is um, these are these generative experiments that I did where um, you have lines, and the lines when they hit another line, something happens. So the line is moving forward, and if it hits a line, it might turn to the left or turn to the right. And I think based on the color, it's like doing different things. So sometimes they get stuck. Like the lines like will get stuck like doing a loop. Um, and I think this is experimenting with a kind of generative algorithm where the line, if the line intersects with some other line, it, it changes its direction. Wow. And how are the colors working here? I think the colors are, are I started the lines and then based on the color, the, the, the behavior is changing. So it, I think yellow lines like, change angle in a certain way and blue lines change angle in a certain way but it's all based on lines checking to see if they intersect with any other line and as they draw they also can intersect with themselves it's very complicated i don't i don't remember <laughs> anything about it <laughs> uh so connor asks uh where where should i get started with blobs he wants to make blobs or they want to make blobs too. Yeah, I mean, so the blobs that I do are all based on physics. So specifically particle systems and the, the key to the blobs are particles that want to repel away from each other, but that are connected by springs. So I always say like, that's one way to go. There are simpler ways to make blobs. So for example, there's an algorithm called meta at the simplest level, sorry, we're gonna back up. At the simplest yeah, level, yeah. like noise, like learning how to work with noise is really powerful. So there are like Perlin noise and simplex noise. These are algorithms similar to like a, a function, like a sine, you know, on your calculator, you say like sine function, um, noise, you pass in a number, it'll give you a number back, right? It's like a, a button on your calculator. Um, and uh, noise is very useful. So you can take a circle and say, let me add a little bit of noise so that change the radius based on my angle around the circle. Um, and that's going to give you a kind of blobby shape. Another algorithm for blobs is metaballs, where you have these, it's almost like implicit um, energy. You have like a little bit of energy like here, here, and here. And then you trace the outside, almost like the boundary of that energy, and you get a blobby shape. Um, and then the third way, which I a lot of my work is in physics simulation where you have particles that want to repel away from each other. They're connected by springs. There's a chain of them that are connected by spring um, and you play with those forces. So I'm, I'm a big fan of simulation where you say like, I'm going to create the world and I'm going to set up all these points and then I'm going to let the world, like I'm going to let all these forces play out and, and the force, you know, moves the object. Wow. So, I have a question here yeah. uh, based on it, it seems like in the comments, we have people at a variety of skill levels, some that are, are just like looking at it is really cool. Some people who are wanting to get into it and some people who are probably pretty advanced yeah. um, and everywhere in between. So 
what would you say for the person who's looking to start to start to get into some of this that isn't yeah. quite ready for maybe a degree but is just like oh it's really cool i want to play around with some of it yeah i mean i think the best thing is to find toolkits right there are a lot of these tools that exist and the tools are really communities like if you go to something like processing so i i helped create a tool called the open frameworks that's a c++ toolkit for doing this kind of work but there's a great tool called processing it's been around for you know 50 more than 15 years. Um, and you go, you, there's a tool, but there's also a community. There's a forum, there are tutorials, there are books, there are workshops. So I always think like, find the tools. And, and just as a creator, generally, um, there are, um, knowing that tools exist is really helpful. So even knowing like the names of the tools and, you know, getting a sense of what they're good for. But I always say, go, you know, Find, find a tool that you're interested in and, and you'll see like, oh, the work, you know, you can usually see when somebody posts something cool to say like made it with processing, made with touch designer. So go find the tool um, and then ask a question on the forum, you know, feel, kick the tires on the community, see what it feels like to be part of the community. Um, and then I always say like, it's easier to learn with other people. So one of the things that, um, makes programming challenging is that it feels like a very solitary experience just you and a computer you know and you're like constantly like breaking things and nothing works and then it works and then it doesn't work and um but you the best thing is to find a workshop right find a class take a class learn with other people ask questions and be in a place where you know you can get unstuck quickly because it learning programming is not fun i think I think it's a little bit hard the way um, if you learn the guitar and you learn the piano, when you learn the guitar, like your fingers hurt, right? It sucks at the beginning to learn the guitar, right? It gets better, but like you at the right at the beginning, you're like, oh, it's really painful. You know, it's very physical. Piano is different. It's like starts very easy and gets crazy hard. So I feel like programming is one is more like guitar where a lot of the things at the beginning, like it really, they're really hard because you, you know, it's you missing a semicolon and you didn't type, you know, you typed I instead of J or something. They're very stupid things that are very, you know, time consuming and frustrating. So um, I always think if you can be in a class with other people, you can learn faster. Wow. And so you're talking about making open for being, being part of that design process of the tool itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I helped create this tool. Could, could you explain a little bit about like what inspired that and how that sure. transpired? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, um, I graduated from Parsons in 2002 and my professor, um, Golan Levin, he's a great, really great, you know, great teacher. Um, he came from Media Lab, MIT, and he invited me to come and work with him after I graduated. So we started to... Um, we started to um, create projects and we were using tools that were not open source. We were using a library of code that was developed at MIT and it wasn't open source. And, and we wanted, I, I had this challenge, which was I was going out and making projects and making art and I would come into the classroom and I would wanna share it with my students. I would wanna share the code or teach the students about computer vision or whatever I was obsessed with. Um, and I couldn't because I was using not open source tools. So Open Frameworks was really created as a way of open sourcing these ideas that we were experimenting with. It was a kind of C++. We were using C++ because it was very fast and you could do computer vision and, and so on. Wow. So what what has transpired since? Like what what's the feedback been and how do you plan to like bring that forward into the future? Yeah, I mean, it's been great. It's been going on for many years. I think the earliest like public versions were like 2006 and 2007. Like all of these things, we never know the lifespan. We don't know how long it's going to last. You know, you don't really think about it. And, um, and always like energy goes down and then something happens and energy comes up and goes down. It's like flying a kite. Um, but what's been really interesting to see the kind of rise, you know, how this thing has ridden over time. I'm not sure what the tools for the future will be. So I don't know, like, I think open frameworks like demystified a lot of computer vision for people and made it easier to work with a lot of libraries. 
But in the future, maybe we need other, you know, I'm in certain we need other tools, you know. So I right now we're we keep developing it. It's a tool I use every day. I think it's really important. Um, and we have a lot of challenges in figuring out how to support, you know, like Apple Silicon Max and all kinds of, you know, technical things. But um, I think we find a way. So if you have a challenge for anybody else out there watching, like to make a tool, like what would you love? Like if there's someone watching that knows somebody that knows somebody, like what would you love if somebody else out there made and was open to you? Yeah, to use? I, I don't know. It's a really hard question to ask. I would say one thing that I really appreciate are tools that are more connecting technologies. So for example, there's a tool called Siphon, which where you can take graphics from one program and pass it to another. And this tool is like a Swiss army knife. Like it allows you to do really complicated and interesting things. Or Open Sound Control is a platform that lets you connect one, like a music app to a visual app or like one app to another. And I feel like connect, like even bridging technologies, connecting technologies are really important. Um, I think one thing is really still really hard. Um, a lot of machine learning, like artists want to work with machine learning and it's really challenging. It's challenging. Um, to get things to work. It's challenging to figure out like what, where you should invest your time. So I always feel like we need better tools um, for that. Like we need, we need, you know, a lot of this stuff is really hard. You have, you need, you need a lot of time to get these things to work. And so tools that make it more accessible. And I think the other thing is that I am really interested in tools and frameworks that live outside of big companies. So, for example, Google puts a lot of money behind machine learning and they have great tools, they have great examples, but I always think it's really valuable to be, as artists, to be a bit outside of, um, or find and create tools that are outside of commercial um, projects, if possible. So, somebody somebody mm -hmm. mentioned Runway, yeah. and I'll, I love Runway. I think Runway is great. I mean, it, it is like, it's it's really... It's, it's in the genre of what I'm talking about, for sure, which is, you know, the ability to test models and be able to experiment and think kind of more combinatorially about, um, about uh, machine learning. But I still feel like there's a lot, there, there's a ton to explore. Wow. So what, what's kind of like on the horizon uh, for you? Like what's... I mean, so a couple of things. So one is that I have a, um, a group. I'm starting a group at the Media Lab. So at MIT Media Lab, where I am trying to um, have help students build those tools, figure out what those tools should be and build them. Um, where, like, what do the designers and artists need, you know, from 2020 on, not from 20, 2000 you know, one on it. So that for me, that's really interesting, which is like, what are, what do those new generation of tools look like? Um, and that's something that I'm really excited about. Um, I am, um, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening at SFPC, like internal things where we're figuring out how to run better and how to better address the, the kind of population. And those things give me a lot of hope. They're really, really, really exciting. So um, was just in a, in a planning meeting and, and thinking about kind of the future of the organization. Um, and then, yeah, I just keep doing my thing. Oh, people always ask me like, what's next? And I, I don't, I don't know. I just keep sketching. I don't have a, I don't have a plan. So if you have something that you would like everybody out there to be involved in, uh, yeah. what, what would you like people to check out or get involved in or, like yeah the discussion or do yeah i mean i would say um one thing to think about is like it's a really important time for um for empathy so i've been in, involved in a lot of conversations where we talk about creativity and like I, I don't know give a talk in a conference and you know people talk about making and creativity but i think it's it's such a crazy moment like if if creativity is is your jam if you want to make stuff like make stuff like go for it it's, you know we have, um, I think that that's really important, but I think the more important thing to focus on is like, what can you do in your community? What can you do to help people at this moment? What can you do to um, create like mutual aid or um, create better um, 
connections with your neighbors or better, um, yeah, better platforms, better schools, better tools um, that connect people and bring people together. Uh, so I always think like this is a moment for empathy and not for creativity. Like creativity is important for sure, but empathy is more important at this moment. So it, it sounds like you're also talking about the idea of like using creativity for empathy. Sure. It could, yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's another way to think about it. I just mean like, I, all right, here's the thing that I really dislike is that um, when COVID started, everybody was talking about like, oh, here's like productivity, you know, here's a productivity hack. Here's how to, you know, like level up and, you know, make a lot. And, and I just feel like th it's like really fucked up. Like this moment is really, really fucked up. It's really terrible. Um, and, and I think we have to, um, you know, like, like do what, like, yeah, practice self care. And if like, if you want to play video games, play video games. And if you want to, you know, like, I don't know, I, I I'm, um, yeah, I got really sensitive about this sort of stuff. So I'm always thinking about like, what is a message, you know, b better to figure out like, um, yeah, what can we do? And how, how can we, um, yeah, I really like Pam, what Pamela was saying, like connecting, like, how can we connect in different ways? And so I would say focus on connections. That's beautiful. Are there any um, specific ways in which you would love to see the world explore more in terms of connecting together or? I mean, uh, one of the things that I found so beautiful about COVID is that we started like a WhatsApp group just with local neighbors. And it's just this little like Brooklyn thing, but it was one of my friends, she was studying how, um, folks in Wuhan were dealing with it. And they, and one of the most important things for, for, for people there was to find, um, to create like discussion groups with their neighbors. And, and it's been, it was so amazing in the, in the kind of height of, in New York, New York was really bad, right? With COVID. Um, and just this moment of like, oh, do you have, can you help with this? Or do you have like, people were looking for, you know, this medical like blood oximeter or, you know, this thing or that thing, you know, and I just feel like we need more of that. Like we need more, um, more groups, more mutual aid. Um, and, uh, and I always feel like the, you know, the, what we said earlier, the world is really hungry for ideas. It's hungry for new tools. It's hungry for new schools. So if you want to, you know, if you can help make that or build that, like do it, like for sure do it. Wow. So, so do you see that there, there's a role with like the creativity and the coding and the, um, that in all of that in getting that message out that, do you think it's just that message out there? Or do you feel like it's like, yeah. inspiration? like what's, what, are, what I mean, are the parts that are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. There's a, you know, it, it is like, it could be, these sorts of things can be used for activism. They could be used for, um, expressing messages. They could be used for play. Um, it's the thing is, I, the thing that excites me about the sort of art technology world is, is that these things are around us, right? They're, they're part of our daily lives. We're glued to our phones. We're using, you know, laptops and screens and, you know, there's sensors all over the place. And, and I think there's a beauty in, in taking those things and trying to figure out how can we use them for poetry? How can we use them for um for expression how can we use things that you know would be you know are used for surveillance how can we use them for for play and for you know critiquing surveillance and and how and and creating conversation you know we we want to create conversations that come from um not from big companies and not from commercial interests but from people and artists and engineers wow that's that's a beautiful thing to have that like come back like how do we how do we as not the corporations get that message out there and like to create beyond and to create the poetry of whatever type it is yeah and it's also to express like so for example with a i love i'm fascinated with ar right i love augmented reality but you can think about a dystopic future where you're just like you see advertisement everywhere right where you just like look it's like um 
I don't know, Back to the Future 2, right? You look everywhere and it's like an advertisement popping out in your face. But, but I also think like AR is this amazing vehicle for ambiguity and for creating like a poetic of space where you're moving, you're using your body to explore. You know, it's about your movement and your, your, your understanding of space. So you, it's important for artists and designers to be there playing with these technologies, showing what's possible, starting a conversation, entering into critical dialogue, understanding the theory, understanding the history, and, and starting conversations. Because the forces that are driving things like AR, they're coming from these big companies. And I have nothing against these big companies, but they have, they have a, a vested interest in pushing the conversation in a certain direction, right? Google, Facebook, big monopolies, they have a vested interest in framing our conversations around machine learning and around AR and, and so on. So I, I don't know. I think it's like our job is to be there showing this a more weird, a more humane future. How could, because um, you're involved in a lot of things, if, if there's other people who aren't involved in your projects and really feel called to putting the um, that poetic verse of life out into the world, how can they uh, join up with your ideas, with your projects and uh, help that move forward into the world? I mean, you can always, I don't, I don't have a really great answer for that. You can always join like the school or open frameworks of these communities. Um, but I would say also just find, find the communities that like speak to your values, right? Find if you're interested in, you know, this sort of world, like go, you know, find, and it's hard now it's hard in the age of COVID, but like find the, um, find the, the places where people are meeting and talking about these things. Um, and, and if that doesn't exist in your surrounding area and group, how would you suggest uh, being a um, like a conduit yeah. for making that space? Yeah, I mean, I always think you, yeah, you have to, if you can't find the community, then you have to think about how do you build it, right? How do you, how do you construct it? And a lot of that is like through, through social networks or through, you know, institutions, et cetera. But like my favorite, you know, I, I always love seeing like meetups and small groups and reading groups and, you know, those sorts of things where you say like, I'm really passionate about something. Like who wants to form a reading group? And like when I go, my, my wife participates in a, in a book club and like they don't even, they'll talk about the book for like 10 minutes and then they're just talking, you know, and like the book is, is a, a pathway to like being in a space with people who are curious and want to talk about what th is happening with their life. And I think you you yeah you can find it like you can you know it one thing i would say about covid is that we're besides time zones we're all in the same you know and it's very different obviously like some places are more locked down than others but we're we're living in kind of zoom land we're living in instagram live land and so in some way making those connections may be easier Maybe there are maybe a lot harder, but may also maybe easier um, because we are, you know, I'm completely surprised about how easy it is to like jump on a Zoom call with strangers or to go give a talk, you know, I give talks now. And it's like, I'm not in the place. I'm giving a talk, you know, like this, like here, like, you know, so this sort of thing, I think you can, you know, it, it's a moment where you can build um, communities for sure. That's so beautiful. And, and, and you see, what are, um, what are some tenets that you think should underlie some of these communities that you think should be built in order to create this uh, po more poetic society uh, yeah. of, with like art, more art and, uh, and empathy? Like what are, what are some maybe tenets that should underlie? Like if there are people out there creating these communities. Yeah. Yeah, what are aspects that you feel like are so important that they really need to? I think one work? thing one thing you really have to think about with communities is like how. One thing that I wish I somebody had told me earlier is kind of plan on, like, 
like think about the time timeline and also how did these com how will the community grow and change and new people step up to leadership and and also like how do you make it yeah i think those sorts of questions are really interesting to ask but also just like finding ways to articulate and understand your values and i have found one of the best things you can do as an organization is like r write down your mission statement right write down what you you know, what are you passionate about? Like, what do you want to do? And that mission statement can, can drive your decision making. And then also be, don't be afraid to revisit it. Like our, with the School for Poetic Computation, we had a mission statement, you know, we existed for five years without it. We had five years, we had a meeting, we came up with a mission statement. And then now in light of, um, you know, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter and this kind of push for um, racial justice, like we're really considering what our mission is. And also, how do we, how does the school as an institution better reflect the, the interests and values of its, um, of its staff and students and, and so on. So there's a lot of like, I think you have to, when you build the community, think about how does the community grow and change as well. Wow, that's, that's, that's so important. As uh, yeah, <laughs> someone who's yeah. done that a couple times yeah. myself, I, I can say like that's those are that <laughs> that I'm kind of just like <laughs> uh, that those are really important things uh, for anybody out there is to like really look at how it's going to grow and change. What are yeah. you know, who? How are you going to change leadership? What yeah? What the mission and vision? Yeah, and also like a lot of these things are just shared exercises like we do we do um shared exercises on code of conduct where we say like how do we want to treat each other just having those conversations like finding ways to have those conversations they um i think they're really important but then they have to be backed up by like okay what if somebody goes out of line like what do we do you know that like you you i think a lot of times the pro some problems with communities that are founded on a lot of optimism but also like there's a pragmatic sense of like how do we deal with this and and uh, you know, there's there are um, yeah there are hard there are hard things to figure out. So yeah. wow, well thank you for bringing us from <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> where we are now to how we can uh, yeah. so some optimism and then how we can pragmatically uh, implement it into our own lives. Uh, yeah, through yeah. art. And no problem. I had no idea the conversation would go this way. Awesome. Yeah. I really like the, the when you just showing me the artworks and it's like almost like a quiz. Like I can't remember how I made it. So it's like a little bit like, yeah, that was a very funny experience. Also seeing myself in in uh like logging off and then coming back on and seeing the time delay, that was that was a trip. Anyway. Thank yeah. you so much for being a part of it and uh and, and thank you to everybody who's been watching and who's gonna follow. I do these um <laughs> these interviews usually every Tuesday, uh, but today I have, uh, I'm doing Friday. So normally I do two on Tuesdays, today's two on Fridays. So next up I have one with uh, Lauren uh, Lichtenstein. And um, so that's coming up at 3 p.m. Eastern on Aaron Jack Line Art. And then next week on Tuesday, I have two more. And then Thursday I have one on Freedom Tapestry Project, which focuses on international artists and people in the artist community more internationally. Uh, and this, on my channel, I just follow, I just interview and talk with, have a conversation with people who interest me and who interest the people in the larger community who connect to the people. So thank you. Thank you, Zach, for being a part of this series, uh, my 63rd interview <laughs> since COVID. <laughs> wow. Nice. I, I, I just love, I love mm. being able to learn and connect and see the beauty of, um, and the heart of mm. people out there in the world and to know, uh, that we're not, we're not alone. Yeah. I think that's a, re that's a really profound message, uh, to end with. We're not alone. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for, for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And where can they find you? One, I mean, one, I'm on. I'm. I post on Instagram all the time. Zach Lieberman. I'm on active on Twitter. Uh, yeah, mostly on the social media is the best way to follow. Cool. Excellent. All right. Super. Thanks, Marin Jack. Marin Jack. Line art. <laughs>
and I will see you soon. <laughs> okay, ciao. Bye. Everybody. All right, ciao. Thanks, Thank you.